Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Krista Tibbet is a Peabody Award winning broadcaster and New York Times best selling author. In 2014, Krista received the National Humanities Medal at the White House from President Obama for thoughtfully delving into the mysteries of human existence on the air and in print. Because there was nothing like this, um, I had to fight for the idea that we should that we should see, you know, that we should give it a chance. I can see how you're opening your soul to your audience and to your guests, and consequently, your guests have done the same to you. There are a lot of great, wise, wise people below the radar. And I think that's where history has, you know, usually been made. And, and some of the people who are really nourishing the world that they can see and touch, because they're so busy doing that, um, they don't have publicists, you know, <laughs> they're, not, they're not getting quoted really part of my mission also to as you, and I love it that you say that you know to introduce some of these voices who are so important to the people in the world they inhabit but are just not visible in the larger world beyond I first discovered Krista Tibbet on public radio and was immediately drawn to her voice and the structure of the content she explored existential questions and was always spiritually bold I was a 20-year-old international college student at the time, who had only been in the U.S. for a couple of years. I was terrified to talk about politics, spirituality, and religions in any kind of social conversations. All I remembered were those stereotypes, heated debates that left everyone in the room angry and frustrated. So I avoided the topics for years, until Krista and her show, Speaking of Faith, came into my life. I was empowered to talk about spirituality again. More importantly, I learned how to connect with people from all walks of life, and I was able to teach and influence others to do the same. In recent years, I felt hungry for an in-depth interview with Krista, but Google search results are primarily dominated by the On Being podcast, where she interviews other people. These 30 minutes I spent with her one-on-one -on -one, was such a thrill. Krista reveals the different stages of on-being from infancy to enterprise. The success didn't come easy. She had to struggle and fight for years. Krista also opened up about her origin stories. As a young girl, she wasn't a bookworm, but a debate club and a trip to Chicago changed her life forever. As a fellow podcaster and radio show host from when I was 16, I picked her brain and found out so much more about her creative process, how she prepares for her interviews, and the talented crew that she has from producers to artists to columnists to technical staff behind the Unbeing Social Enterprise. So thank you, Krista Tibbet, for teaching me and so many other people out there what it means to be human and to trust our inner voice, be our own guru. At the same time of this episode's release, it is Phase World Podcast's first birthday coming up on October 25th, 2015. Looking back in this past year, I would never imagine meeting and speaking with all these wonderful people. I want to take this opportunity and thank you, all my guests, my listeners. Please reach out to me by leaving a comment dropping me an email. I'd like to connect with all of you, or perhaps you could be connected to one another. Without further ado, please welcome Krista Tibbet to this special anniversary episode of the Face World Podcast. Hello, this is Faye. Hi, Faye. It's Krista. Hi, Krista. Uh, I so wish you were in the room right now. I would totally <laughs> run up and give you a huge hug. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And I know I haven't had a chance to really introduce myself. So 
Uh, here's my one minute pitch. Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, I am Faye and I am a digital producer at Arnold Worldwide by day. And uh, in the evening, one of my passion projects is Faye's World Podcast, where I interview people from, from all walks of life. And most of them are my, my own mentors. And I only started doing this uh, last year. And you are certainly absolutely uh, one of my top inspirations and mm. and so far you know there's nothing compared to uh on being and uh but having so much fun and one of the one of the reasons I would like to connect with you is um Whenever I search for Krista Tibbet interviews or with Krista, I feel like there's just not enough interviews about you. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so uh, I am so thrilled uh, to be here, but I feel like I'm going to add an introduction. I am okay. so impressed by On Being, Peabody Award winning. And the funny thing is yesterday there was a uh, Webby Award representative here at Arnold telling us that Webby Award is the industry's most competitive award out there and I realize your podcast along with your website is uh actually has won a uh, webby award it's yeah. so incredible yeah yeah no it's exciting yeah so I before we kind of jump into your empire right now I wonder <laughs> if there's an opportunity for us to kind of go all the way back and ask about Krista's origin story like when when you were a little girl how where were yeah. you like well um I grew up in a very small town in Oklahoma, and it was, um, you know, I didn't have much of a sense of the big wide world out there, um, and I grew up in a really, I grew up in a Southern Baptist, my grandfather was a Southern Baptist preacher, it was very kind of immersive religious world, um, uh, so, you know, it kind of feels like, um, like a, a bit of a bubble that I grew up in, but when I was about 16 I went I was I did a lot of drama and debate that's I, I didn't read a lot of books or do as much nearly as much thinking as I do now but I did drama and debate and I think that's you know that's how my mind came alive and um and I went to a debate camp this summer after my junior year in high school to Chicago and it kind of opened the world up to me and and then after that I just never stopped moving <laughs> wow, that's like completely unexpected. <laughs> I, uh, what did you think? What did you, what did you expect? I, I I read your bio. I feel like it just, you know, if I, I take, take a step back, I, I thought to myself, whenever uh, I hear your name and I mention on being to other people, and when people say, and trust me, they're, I, I'm sitting in a, just so you know, I'm sitting in a kind of a blocked uh, room right now, stopping from all your fans from rushing in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one gentleman said, please tell Krista that he's married. Um, mm -hmm. Please tell her that she's my... I have a spirit crush on her <laughs> and <laughs> she's, she's in the conversation between me and my wife every single day. And we, we love talking about it. Um, so, you know, for me, when I, when I think of you, I feel like I am just so glad that there is a female figure out there and for us to learn from, you know, personally, mm -hmm. I, I'm 32 and I've been able to learn from you since my early twenties and, mm -hmm. uh, from, public radio to the past few years, you are front and centered on my podcast app. And I have, I feel like I've access to you all day long. And to me, you're, you represent this wealth of knowledge uh, that I feel like you must have started since you're, you're an infant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, um, well, first of all, thank you for all of that. And it, you know, well, you know, you're doing a podcast, you do radio and, and you, you just you send it out into the void, and then you and then you keep going, and and so it I love you know it's it means so much to me to hear this, and and I do I do love it when I hear about you know being a conversation starter between other people, you know, like that the conversation becomes infectious, and I, I that makes me so happy. Um, but I I think uh, you know people often say oh well you you must have grown up in a family of great listeners and the, the truth is i think i'm the other story which is just as human that i that i have ended up pursuing things that i didn't know right and because i hadn't really been exposed to the life of the mind or to to great listeners or great questioning i was just so hungry for that when i found it and uh you know and i, I appreciate every moment that i do what i do 
So, so that's, you know, that's the other way we operate. <laughs> For sure. So it sounds yeah. like the success of On Being, uh, did it surprise you? I mean, did it expect, did you expect it to grow to now the world's, you know, top 50 podcast, uh, you know, of all po podcasts, not even just a certain category. And for my listeners, there's, there's a quarter to like half a million podcasts out there. Yeah. Well, it's been such a, it, it's been this real um, trajectory, right? I mean, I started with two radio stations back in 2003, and it's been something that started really small and was always growing. Um, but to me, you know, so to me, I, I don't think of it as something that suddenly got big. And it was also something that I had to work very hard to, to get into the world. There was a lot of skepticism and I had to really fight for this and I had to fight for it for years. So it's really only a couple of years ago that I realized that I was very comfortable in the role of seeing myself as a guerrilla warrior and I was pretty good at that <laughs> and that that wasn't appropriate anymore right but as you say I have something that's that's grown and you know it's solid and you can kick the tires and um and the, and that that it does look to other people like um like this success and but it, it's a funny thing because I've been with it all the way from its infancy um that's still something I I, I don't think I see it the way other people see it and I think that's also just fine. I think it's okay for me to continue to <laughs> to go on feeling like this is this little this infant that I have to nurture. Yeah, and then you're you're mother of two, and I feel like there's yeah. that parallel and, and comparison. Yeah. Um, what are some of the struggles that you you had to deal with or, or manage at the beginning? I. It was so. It was. It's, it was a different world. It was the pre nine eleven world. Mm -hmm. um, it was. It was the end of the twentieth century, early two thousand, uh, early you know two thousands. We were coming off a stretch in American life where, um, after a period where where voices where religious voices had been pretty had been pretty much on the sidelines. Um, they had a, you know just a very few strident voices had burst into view. You had a lot of. Um, politicized religiosity, um, and then of course nine eleven happened, and and you had you had people Americans being introduced to Islam as a religion by way of this you know horrific act of terror. So it was a moment when religion was in the news with a new intensity, um, but it was just such a sliver of what this part of life is about, and. So, you know, what I wanted to do is say, you know, this part of life that we call religious, we, we, we talk about spiritual life, we use the word faith, you know, each of, each of these words has a different meaning in every single life that lives them. Um, and this part of life is so fluid, it's so diverse, and it's so important um, in all the different ways people grapple with it. Um, so, but the struggle was that uh, because so many of the forms and the voices that people heard were really divisive and in some cases very toxic, um, the struggle was to convince people and, and, and especially in public media that you could create a program around this subject and it would not be proselytizing and it would open imaginations rather than shutting them down and it wouldn't alienate people and it wouldn't be inflammatory and it wouldn't... Um, you know, it wouldn't be, ex uh, it wouldn't make people feel excluded. Um, so the struggle was because there was nothing like this. Um, I had to fight for the idea that we should that we should see. You know, that we should give it a chance. And um, and and I, I think you know this whole part of life again is very fraught with stereotypes. So I think that in some ways that struggle is always there mm -hmm. to to convince people that we can be spacious, you know, and that we can talk about this, these subjects, all the things we talk about when we talk about spirituality and religion. Um, and, you know, and that it, that, that it can be intelligent, that it can have intellectual content as well as spiritual content, and that, it can, that we can surprise each other, and that this won't be divisive. You know, all of those things were not... A lot of our prior experience tells us those that's not possible. This is Fei Wu, and you're listening to the Face World podcast. Today on Face World, I am chatting with Krista Tibbet 
who is a Peabody Award-winning broadcaster and New York Times best-selling author. We uncover her origin stories, the successes and struggles of unbeing, her creative process, and her mission for this social enterprise.、Uh, I, of course, I had to read. Speaking of faith, <laughs> and I am so glad I listened to it on my.、Uh, When I go to sleep, when... oh really? Yeah, I, when I go... sure. <laughs> <laughs> that recording a book, recording a book is just its own experience.、Um, wow, what, what was I, it like? I just hate to hear how it sounded, but I'm glad you like it. <laughs> oh, I I love it. You know, when I'm really well, I commute to work、uh, in Boston. As you know, we have the train that was、uh, made in 1898 and is super loud. And I just love I love your podcast quality. I love the quality of the book, and、uh, it, it's Impossible for me to hold a, a book because I have to balance on one foot most of the commute anyway. So、uh, mm-hmm. I was so happy that you, you know you were the narrator, like because I I cannot stand having anybody else like read your book. I have to hear <laughs> your voice, and I feel like the your book. I know it was your first book published in two thousand seven. That made me feel very empowered because. For the you know I'm I forgot to mention I'm originally from Beijing and I've been here since I was in high school, but I know that there's one topic, one area, which is religion that I absolutely cannot、um, cannot really put it in any social conversations because yeah, yeah.、Um, and then your book really empowered me to say wow I can. I I now know how to talk about it, and、uh, one quote that I I love always warms、uh, my heart is, "The more we can understand the world and its intricacies, the more we can begin to connect with our own beings."、Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was just so lovely stated,、uh, and well, therefore, yeah, I think that therefore that's why you were able to connect with so many other people, and when you when you interview other people, I. I Think your spirit not only is represented in print in the book, but certainly is in in your voice. I can sense all your emotions. I can see how you're opening your soul to your audience and to your guests, and consequently, your guests have done the same to you.、Hmm. Um, and you know, you are their guidance, and in a way that they're very very familiar names and whom I consider my mentors: Seth Godin, Maria Popova. Those episodes.、Yeah. I've listened to、uh, embarrassingly at least five to ten times each, <laughs> and 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 at the same time, you've spoken to so many other people. Honestly, are not really popular、uh, in you know today's sort of the public media, and help people like myself and, and, and many people outside of this room right now to be exposed to their work. So yeah, that's really important to me because、yeah. um, there's. You know, there's this this phrase we have in English below the radar,、mm-hmm. right? But you know, there are a lot of great, wise, wise people below the radar,、um, and I think that's where history has, you know, usually been made. And and some of the people who are really nourishing the world that they can see and touch because they're so busy doing that. Um, they don't have publicists, you know. They're not. They're not getting quoted or photographed. But, but I, I that that's it's it's easy to、um, the expected thing when you have a media project is to interview people who are already famous,、mm-hmm. and I and I and I you know and I do interview people who are famous for good reason. But it's it's really part of my mission also to as, and I love it that you say that you know to introduce. Some of these voices who are so important to the people in the world they inhabit, but are just not visible in the larger world beyond. Yeah, and then I can imagine that some of them are not. You know, this is not what they do. They don't、yeah. probably don't do a lot of public speak, speaking.、Uh, you know, I can think of a few names like you know Grace Lee Boggs. What an amazing! <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't know there were Chinese people in America a hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah, or women, much less immigrant women, who got philosophy PhDs in philosophy when they were you know in the nineteen thirties. I mean, yeah, I know her story was incredible. Yeah, it's so different, and I think、mm. about the, the wealth of knowledge that she carried with her, and she the clarity. I know when she when you interviewed her, she may already be ninety seven, ninety eight. The clarity of her thinking, 
And when she talks about that, she would have these uh, young people, I guess some possibly in their uh, 60s and 70s, to gather in our living room and have their, I just imagine that uh, it's sort of that harmony and that community right there in her living room. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. So it's. It, she died. Did you know that she died? She just died very recently. I saw that. I saw a post yeah. from you. Was it maybe two two weeks ago? Or I don't know. Anyway, but but she lived such an amazing life. She to the very did. end. To the very end. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then my heart, because of listening to the the podcast first, and then uh, learning that she passed on, uh, and my heart. I mean, I was at work and just realized that it, something so profound. Uh, mm-hmm. Such a connection between me and another Asian woman. In in this case, uh, mm. you know, seventy years older than I am, but I just yeah. feel like she was part of me for some reason, and and I feel like she I consider her as one of the pioneers who established uh, sort of our presence and how American people get first get to know Chinese people. And she she's this it's just incredible human being, made me so proud. <laughs> Well, I I just can't tell you how how much that pleases me that that the show can have that effect, and um, I mean that's just it's wonderful, and it also says something about this this medium of radio, of podcasting, of audio. Mm-hmm. It's so intimate, right? So I met Grace Lee Boggs in her living room, and and also we're, I'm talking about intimate things. This is a subject that is intimate. So, but but you also, it, you know, and, and the, the the magic and the mystery of radio. Is that you? You know, in some way, you also were in the room with us, right? You yeah. you experienced everything that discovery um, that I experienced, and then to think of it rippling out like that and being so meaningful um, for your identity is just beautiful. Yeah, I feel like uh, I'm not sure about you, Krista. I feel like you've been in my life for the past 15 years. <laughs> and, wow. Yeah, it's very intimate, especially for the past five years at the quality uh, of your podcast. And I, I just literally feel like you're in the same room with me. And then. And another area, I, ever since I started my own podcast, I received uh, uh, certainly a lot of encouragement as, as well as some of the criticism. A lot of people my age uh, or, as you know, sort of the, the common theme now is the, the lip service. It's these 25 men who continue to interview each other and saying why yeah. each other is so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then yet you establish, I, I tell people that to me, you're very different uh, because you could very well be like everybody else, find your niche and say, um, I'm in financial services. This is exactly what I'm inter- what my interviews are about. This is the only thing I'll ever focus on. And uh, some of them start with episode number one, Seth Godin. What are you going to do about this? So, <laughs> you know, it's it's so, but at the same time, you chose a very different path and um, and for that reason we love it and I guess I guess one of the questions that I feel like uh, I can feel for you as a um, uh, as a reporter by the 1016 I worked at China National Radio Station and I had my own show for just one year it's not really worth bragging about but I I know very well just the amount of devotion and you have to dedicate to this line of work and for you to wake up every single day, make your coffee, make your tea and and go back uh, right into it. So I'm so curious about your creative process and how do you really believe in the process and dedicate yourself every single day? Well, I have to say, yeah, importantly, that I'm surrounded by great people. And, and it's true that, that in the, you know, in, in 2000, 2001, when I was first starting this, it was often me all by myself, you know, basically sneaking into the radio station in the middle of the night, didn't have an engineer, didn't have, you know, had about two people who believed in it. But that's not true anymore. It hasn't been true for a long time. I have, I have wonderful people with me. Um, producers and also my colleague Trent, who who creates our website. You know, he really is the one who won those Webby Awards. And um, so, so the, the the process is it's collective. I mean, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm the one who finally has to say yes. I want to interview that person. I want to take on this subject. I'm the one who has to be in the room and excited about it. But we're. I mean, I would say there's this there's this kind of ongoing process of 
Um, there's always a long list that we have of, of people who I would like to get to one day or, or ideas that I'd like to get to one day. And we're always asking, well, who would be the right voice to, 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 to flesh that out? Um, and then, of course, things are happening in the world. People are sending ideas. Um, we, get a lot of, we get a lot of ideas. I think everyone has an idea about who they'd like to hear on this show when I'm ever, whenever I'm out speaking. Um, people come to me and, and, and although, uh, although we have way too, you know, there's, there are many more ideas than shows we can get to immediately. Those things do rise to the surface, a lot of them. So it's, it's, it's a combination of what is planned and what's a long time, um, in the, in the planning and then, and then things, voices, ideas that just arise in the moment and we can be nimble and spontaneous. It's, it's very unscientific, but I've, I, I've, I've gotten comfortable with that. <laughs> nice. So, so basically who serves to the top, whether the person or the theme or the subject is mm -hmm. depending on, uh, how you feel at that moment, what feels right to you. And it's just about making the choice. Yeah. Yeah, but and but sometimes as I say, I mean, I sometimes I've said for five years I want to interview this person, and then there's this moment when it's it's the right time. Mm. Well, I feel like you have a superpower, which is uh, <laughs> the ability to talk to anybody. And for people who haven't listened to your podcast for as long, I've heard you talking to poets, uh, medical doctors, and uh, I mean the list goes on and on and, and your ability to speak to such subject matter experts. And I wonder how do you condition yourself to prepare for these questions? More importantly, how to react on the spot? <laughs> I do. I, so, um, I'm a big, um, I, I love science fiction when I was growing up and I, um, I don't know if you know, uh, M Mr. Spock in the Star Trek, Star Trek series. Um, he did this thing called a Vulcan mind meld where it would be, he would put his hands on someone else's head and it would be my mind to your mind, my thoughts, <laughs> your thoughts to my thoughts. <laughs> so I say that my, my, I do, a, I do a lot of preparation for my, for my interviews. I think an, an unusual amount, um, compared to other, to other interviewers, uh, I take that part of it really seriously, and I, I say it's the Vulcan mind meld approach because I I try to um, read whatever I can, um, you know, if somebody has written books, obviously, but also uh, dig around and see if it's like you said, looking for interview, you know, see if they've done other interviews. Um, I I try to learn as much as I can about a person so that I'm not only really well prepared for discussing their ideas, but also that I that I kind of feel like I can go into an interview with a sense of how they think. And when I'm talking to a quantum physicist, you know, I, I will not understand 90% of, 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 of the ideas, but I, I, I can, I can have a sense of how someone thinks. And, and part of what that does at the beginning of the interview is to, is to put someone at ease. Um, you know, I think we all know the difference between sitting with someone and needing to explain ourselves or defend ourselves. Or when you sit with someone and you, you have this sense that communicates itself, you know, tangibly, right? Oh, okay, they get me. I can relax. And then you can go so much deeper. So I try to prepare so that that's the experience someone has um, when we start to speak. And then, you know, I prepare to ask good questions, to, be, to really be able to follow what they're saying, and um, I mean, I, I have lots of notes in front of me. Now, if the interview goes well, I, if the conversation takes off, I think a measure of success is that I've put my notes to one side and I'm not, I'm not adhering to them very closely. But the fact that I put that effort into the preparation means that I'm just that much more present and that much more with the conversation. How long does it take to prepare for an interview if i had to guess <laughs> i see this bookshelf on the on the about page, yeah right. so yeah so how, how long on average i guess it's different it's, depending on the guest. it's really different depending and that is something that uh there is such i think this is a wonderful thing about getting older is realizing if you do the same thing for a while mm -hmm. you really do get better at it you know that's such a wonderful feeling mm. Um, so for example, preparing, I used to spend days, you know, sometimes I would spend an entire week and early on the show was monthly. So I actually had that, I could do that. Um, 
and now it's more I, I I'm really able to settle in and I might knowing that I have an interview with someone coming up I might start reading into their things you know early on than the week or two before but it's pretty much kind of the day before and the day of the interview that I just completely immerse and I've just I don't know I've just gotten so much more efficient I know what I'm looking for I know how to make my notes and I love when you mentioned that uh, I do. I feel like I do the same. I try to do as much uh, studying as possible. But I always just watch that magic moment after you know five minutes or so. People get so comfortable, and you just naturally push your notes aside. Yeah. And, and realize they've taken you to this magical wonderland of things you never knew you would discover right there on the spot. Yeah, and there's just there's some there's some really wonderful creative tension between like you prepare in order to be able to put your notes to one side right but you're still you're, there's so you're still you're still contributing more to the conversation even as a listener um when you're not looking at your notes because you you got ready in that way mm-hmm. absolutely and mm-hmm. uh uh, you know, one one of the things I I didn't bring up is NLP, which is uh, as you know, neuro linguistic programming. Yes. <laughs> so I feel like is that something that you've studied and you've done uh, potentially in person? Because I I just have a, that feeling that when you facilitate a conversation, I I'm not in the room with you guys, but I can see people kind of leaning towards you and having a conversation as if they've known you their entire life? Well, so this may shock you, but about, um, I'd say about 70% of my interviews are not in person. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, now, the technology is amazing because you it does, you can't, write The technology, it sounds like we are sitting across the table from each other. And I... I mean, I do, I do live interviews and it's a, it's a, and I really enjoy that. And it's a, but it's a, it's a completely different experience. I, again, this is something that now I've done for many years. So I've gotten so much better at it, but there is, there are advantages to only having the human voice to work with because, um, and I have done, Oh, in my years doing this, I've had experiences where I, I've been with people in person. But when you're with someone in person, you're working with a lot. You're you're not only working with the words and the voice, you're working with eye contact and body language and your impression of them physically. You know, there's this whole visual component that's so overwhelming. And um, and when it's, you know, it's just like this, like you and I are talking. Mm-hmm. But everything can be communicated, you know, through the human voice. So many, so many layers of intimacy um, and information, and to only have that to work with is a great discipline because what our because our listeners only have that to work with. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, I've come to, um, if, if not prefer it, to you know feel like I enjoy this this as much as I do the in person. Wow, that's it's really amazing, and <laughs> thank you so much for your time and because uh i was told uh by lily to make sure i stop at 2 30 sharp Uh, all these things happening here today but i'm so i'm so glad we did this i'm really happy that you reached out you know i don't tweet but i i go on twitter and i love just corresponding with people who write to me so it was wonderful that you wrote and i really enjoyed this and i love hearing about i'm just so happy to now to know you're out there and to think of you out there um, on my my podcast (laughs) Thank you so much, and and I think there's one line that uh, I would, I love how you write. My religion is kindness. A moral position is a passionate caring inside you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm actually not sure if this is something uh, from a different book, but it certainly is found in uh, uh, speaking of faith. And and thank you so much for for doing what you do. And I really really hope you continue to do this for as long as you possibly can for the next fifty a hundred years. <laughs> Well, thank you. And listen, I, I have a new book coming out in April, and I know I'll be doing some events in New York. So you're in New York, right? You're I'm in New in, York. I'm in Boston, but I go to New York. Oh, you're all in Boston. The time. I may be in Boston, so um, come see me if you're if I'm ever doing something in your town. Please come say it. Come introduce yourself. Oh, will do. I can't okay. wait. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. 
that is F-E-I-S-W-O-R-L-D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at FaceWorld. Until next time, thanks for listening.